Nate, I'm so happy that you're here. I have been a fan of yours since it feels like day one of like you being here, like for all of us to see. And you are so lovable. It's ridiculous and um, talented. So that's always a great combo when somebody is like endearing and adorable and really good at what they do. So thanks and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. I want to talk about all the things as much as we can over the next little while. And um, I'm most interested in like the beginning of this. So I just am curious, like before you were who you are in the zeitgeist, like for you on your path, like what was the sort of like awareness or moment where you're like, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to go all in on this. Like, how did that actually happen Cause that's kind of where the blueprint got drawn before we saw what actually became of what you built. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a really, let me take myself back, um, you know, 30 years and, and 30 years plus and see where I was, but, you know, I was relatively young. I went to college in outside of Chicago. Um, and one of the things that I chose to do was do a semester, um, abroad which is like really obnoxious to talk about. It's like what people always bring up at a dinner party. So I try not to, but what it, what it did for me was that it sort of recentered me outside of this like college kid drinking beer out of a hat and, you know, um, trying to get everywhere with a fake ID to, Oh, the world is actually pretty sophisticated out there. And there's a lot of things that I find delightful visually Um, a lot of it was rooted in history and being in places that my husband, Jeremiah always talks about seeing modern life in ancient places. And I think we both share an attraction to that. And so, you know, at, at 19 years old, walking around the streets of Paris, getting purposely lost, um, pre cell phones, pre pre Google maps, pre everything, obviously, um, and touring sort of these chateaux and museums and neighborhoods and, and local produce markets in the morning when the city was starting to come to life and, and going to the flea markets and, and trying to figure out how to get enough money to buy black motorcycle boots, which seemed really important at the time. Um, <clears throat> it was just like, for me, I think it was, it, 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 I realized at that moment that, Um, I really couldn't go back to my, you know, liberal arts college on the North shore of Chicago and just kind of go to another dive bar and feel satisfied with that. And so what I did was I, a girlfriend of mine, still a very good friend, um, was working for the interior designer, Alessandra Branca, who was a big deal in Chicago and is actually still a big deal, but she, um, she introduced her to Leslie Heinemann auctioneers where she um, started working. And so she would, she and I would have drinks or go for $5 Thai food. And I was a junior in college back from my semester abroad. And she would say to me, you would really love this. It's like so fascinating. It's the, you know, that's the history of decorative arts. It's the, it's where design meets um, culture and meets beauty and meets, history and you have to have this knowledge base you have to be a generalist and understand what the best silver makers were and who made the most beautiful porcelain for the last three centuries and you have to be able to identify on site um the different periods of furniture and the different countries that they came from you should intern here and so i went down for my interview and my little like you know gucci loafers and whatever and um i got the internship and when I finished college, I, I, I actually worked three days a week as an intern and put all my classes Thursdays and Fridays. Um, school was like 45 minutes away if you drove like me, two hours if you drove like a normal human being. And, um, you know, I just remember being immersed in this world of, 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 of everything we, I just discussed. And um, it, it was fascinating. And um, the the woman who owned the the auction house, Leslie Einman, um, everyone wanted me fired. I was the assistant to Colleen Euland from Cleveland, Ohio. And Colleen would go into Leslie's office and the doors were like paper thin and I would hear her cry. He's the worst assistant. He's like so terrible. You have to fire him. 
I, I, I look at his inbox and it's things from like three weeks ago that letters he was supposed to type to bankers and everything. And he just doesn't do anything that he's not interested in. And so Leslie called me into her office and lit what we called one of her prison cigarettes, which were menthols and sat down, sat me down. And I sat, I used to sit on the radiator and she said, everyone wants me to fire you, but I actually think that there's something in you. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you in charge of a series of monthly auctions. And the point is you're going to sell all the junk because we, when we take a big estate, just because we want the paintings or the silver, there's sofas in there that have no real resale value. So I want you to figure out how to tell every young person in Chicago that they can buy a down sofa for $50 and you're going to be the auctioneer. I'm going to train you and you're going to have to work every Saturday um, or you can quit. And those are your choices. And I said, no, I, I definitely want to do it. She said, well, everyone in the company is going to hate you. Most people do already, but they're going to really hate you now um, because you're going to have to get the property department to help you and the marketing department to help you. You're in charge. Um, 12 sales a year, once a month. And so I took the job and, um, and I had the best time. And what happened was, is that when I had something that was worth more than a couple thousand dollars, I would actually go to someone's house because there's like a regular clientele at an auction house. And then I was obviously trying to get the young people to come by as well, which I was moderately successful at. But I would go to someone's house and I'd say, well, look, if we took the painting off the wall here and we put that big, I have a great sideboard coming in and you could flank it with a pair of your dining chairs and then that mirror from your entry could go here. And so I was redesigning spaces as in the role of an auctioneer so that I could sell uh, a cabinet or a sideboard wow. or, you know, and, it, and I realized like I, I know how to do this. I really love doing this. Um, I'm really like snoopy i like to see how people live still it's still like completely fascinating to me and um it was an opportunity for me to really stop and take stock and consider you know i didn't know if i was going to be good at anything else but i thought i could really put a space together and so i went to leslie and i quit and she referred me my first like 10 clients and um that's how my design firm was started when i was 23. I'm so happy that I asked you that question. And I'm so glad that that answer was just so much fun. That was such a fun ride to go on. I relate so much to that. I did a semester abroad in college in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And as a kid who grew up in Boca Raton, Florida, where the most cultural thing was a Borders Books and Music. Well, I... there's two J's, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Two J's, right. <laughs> All the Jews know exactly. Yeah, what exactly. Um, it's delicious. So, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, good for break the fast. But anyway, so I went to Barcelona and I was like, what, what is this? Yeah. Like, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen is yeah. Barcelona. And then after college, I went to Jerusalem which was supposed to be three weeks and I stayed for three years and I walked around Jerusalem and I was like, how gorgeous is this place? Like, how, how did I not know how pretty it is? Like, you know, how right. beautiful Tel Aviv is. Like, it's so beautiful. And so I just kept staying and extending my trip because the words that you said really echo how I felt like ancient places mm -hmm. that evoke with modern life without oh my God, like that, <clears throat> I, that exact combo is so mesmerizing to see. It's people. mesmerizing. And, and like, honestly, like it, it's funny because Jeremiah coined that. And it was when we were on a boat in Venice and we turned to the left and on a boat on the one of the canals were like 60 DHL and FedEx boxes stacked up in a boat on their way to be delivered to somebody's door. Right. And we right. both just looked at each other and we were like, that's it. It's a FedEx box in a boat because that's the only way you can get it there. So, you know, this uh. is a place that, you know, from from 1300 has been, you know, been early earlier was was a trade capital and now it's still a trade capital but it's like somebody's like cookies that someone's mother made that's being delivered to somebody's house on a boat in right. a fedex box right you know yeah it's like that zooming out and knowing your place in the history of all things and the yep. connection to <clears throat> all things and where you are in that there's yep. so much meaning and so i love love that story. So I'm, I'm really into the story, so I don't want to go away from it. So what happened next? So you got your first handful of clients 
And then what was you know, the next? Listen, I, I had my first handful of clients. I had no idea what I was doing. And I still maintain this to this day, almost 30 years later. But, you know, to be a great designer is to have really good relationships and really strong sources. Um, I knew right away that was like my, my weakest link when I started my business. I had a really fun, very rich client um, who said to me, I want to do a wall of bookshelves here, floor, you know, built-in bookshelves. I don't you think that's a great idea. And I said, yes. And then I thought, oh, fuck, like, I don't know who makes bookshelves. <laughs> like, you know, like, I've been like, what? Oh, yeah, it's a great idea. But like, you know, who makes it? But, you know, you make those relationships and you maintain those relationships. And, and you know, in design, the people, the trades, the people that actually create the concepts that you, I'm sorry, that execute the concepts that you've created, you, 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 you use those skills over and over again. It's almost more important than the client. So it's your job as like a decent human being and a, and a decent businessman in this world to protect those people and their interests. Usually they're not making millions of dollars doing hand forged iron lighting or building custom millwork. Yeah. So you have to protect them. And so I knew that really early on. And um, once I found the people that I wanted in the world that could make what I wanted them to make, I really made it a point and I still do to protect them. Um, and um, it's, it's important. You know, it's, it's like, it's, it's one of those things. It's like, it's like basic good manners. It's like why, why we left LA because no one has stationery. No one writes a note. I'm like, yuck. Um, but right. here, no one has stationery. No, right. they don't. They're like, what do you mean? How'd you get your name on this? That's so weird. Wow. Um, so, but did you, do you have a, do you have a, do you have an engraving plate in your basement? Um, so, I, I, you know, yeah, exactly, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it definitely, that was like the, the weakest link when I first started the firm. Um, I was of course working alone. Then I hired my assistant away from the auction house and she came to work with me, which was a super Jerry Maguire, Jerry Maguire minus the fish tank. Like everything else was exactly yeah. the same. <laughs> um, I was like, it'll be fine. I swear I'll be able to pay you and you'll be able to pay your rent. I think. Um, here, let me write you this lovely note on my stationery, like first lives club, but it was, it, you know, it was, it was just a, it was like a beautiful, um, moment for me. And what's interesting is that my husband has built this insane career, which I'm so proud of him for with almost no guidance from me. Cause he didn't want it and he didn't ask for it, but I've always maintained it's actually more fun to build than it is to maintain. Mm hmm it's so true. And so, you know, that that's always, and I used to say that to him when he would get really stressed out with his first licensing deal or his first speaking engagement or his 10th speaking engagement or his 20th licensing deal. I'd be like, you're in it, my friend, trust me. Like I have been still growing obviously, but the maintenance is just slightly less exciting. It's so true. It's like our favorite part is in the creation it's that yeah. expanded thought oh my god we could do this it's like being a little yeah. kid in the backyard building something versus like okay you know so right. i see a lot of successful people once you build one thing then you're like let's just build you move something on else. yeah right and that's i think why my career has been in so many different i've had my hands in so many different things reddit writing and television and licensing and public appearances and podcasts and you know everything um that, that I've always had going on because I just don't think that I could handle sitting behind a desk all day oh God, and, no. you know, just no. doing, doing the same thing every day. It's not a vibrational match to who you are. I mean, because you're, you've tapped into that flow state with creativity, it just doesn't want to let you go. No, right? it can't go. No, I have a question you mentioned in the string of things that you've been up to television. And obviously we all know, you know, that you, had this like really big seat at the table uh, on Oprah's couch and you were really uh you 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 handled it like at least it looks like with such tremendous ease you know i'm just curious for you behind the scenes of that like was that surreal i'm sure that changed your life where you could go get a bagel and then the next day you you really couldn't go get a bagel without 15 people stopping you between your house and the bagel store so what is that experience like having lived it? Um, so it's much more gradual than that. 
Okay. It's not an instant thing. I, I think the 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 thing that people who have never stepped out on stage, who you know, think is that like you go out once and then all of a sudden you have like no privacy and you really can't have a bagel. And you know, if you do, then you know, you just feel ashamed because it's just especially if it's not scooped and I don't know. But I think, you know, I think that the truth is is that that opportunity for me was obviously a tremendous opportunity. Um, the fame part of it is like the least interesting thing for me. I've never aspired to that. That never was something that made me tick. I never wanted to be like, ooh, I'm in People Magazine. Like even in my late 20s when I started on Oprah, I wanted to be successful and I wanted to be strategic, but I didn't really care about being famous. That was like something that, you know, and actually if you look, I've always been sort of under the radar. There's always been like a lovely story about my house and then another <laughs> lovely story that we sold that house. And then, you know, it's never really been like, even the big moments for me in life, surrogacy and having children and getting married, there was like, there's a little splash and then it kind of goes away. And so, you know, I've, I've never been, you know, like, like, I would have been bad on Vanderpump rules. Let's just say that. Okay. That never like being famous with no privacy and no money to yeah. protect yourself and your family is not, not that they have no money, but like that is not a dream scape for me. My mother, the country club, different story. She really likes to trade on those stories. Um, I remember once she asked me to invite her and 10 girlfriends to Oprah's favorite things show. And I was like, you don't need a Pontiac and they're all teachers. So you're going to have to back down. Um, the answer is no mom. But the, um, the interesting thing I think for, for me with that opportunity was that somehow at 27 or ish, somehow I knew that I was there as an extension of Oprah's messaging and Oprah's brand. Mm -hmm. And that anything that I did to carve out my own name and my own brand would reflect on her and what she had built and what she had carefully curated. And I was very careful. You're making a face at me, but I was very careful at the time. Empathy. Well, because you know what? I watched all these people try and figure out their angle and they didn't do it properly. They were really sneaky about it. They were weird. And I watched that hurt her feelings. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to be that guy. And so when I had my first opportunity to design product, obviously the company's first question was, well, will it be on the Oprah show? Because I was on every month for 13 years. And so I went to Oprah and I said, well, I have this opportunity to design things for the home. Um, it was with linens and things. And I'm really excited about it. And I've never done it. And it's going to be really scary for me. And they're asking me if you'll feature the collection on the show, because obviously they want to make money. And she said to me, wow, you're the first person to just come into my office and just ask me that, like straight up. And I said, well, listen, I, I want to be open with you. You know, I'm never going to do anything that embarrasses you. I'm never going to try and sell, um, you know, hair growth serum or, you know, I'm, never, I, I'm not going to sit on a toilet at a home improvement convention and cash the check for the appearance fee. Like, I'm going to always like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm not going to, I'm going to really try not to get carried away with this. I'm going to really try to be respectful, but I also want to be clear with you. Like I'm not doing the show cause I want to be in us weekly. I'm doing the show cause I, I want to be successful. I want these opportunities. I've always kind of wanted these opportunities and I know I can do it. And she said, I support you go ahead and do it. Um, and if the collection I like, I'll put it on the show. She said, don't make it in a, un unaffordable you know, make sure that the audience can afford to do what you're out there in the world doing. That would be, a, I think, a bad strategic move for you. So stay mass, which was really great advice, which I've always done and um, and continue to do. And um, and then we, you know, we, we she did have it on the show. She had a whole hour long special and it was a whole huge feature in Oh at Home magazine and it sold really, really well. And it was like a really phenomenal experience. And then that led to obviously many other partnerships with brands and, and companies and, and things like that. But I was always, I, I'm still protective of Oprah. It's funny. Like I still like, not that she needs me to protect her, but you know, we're, we're, our names will be tied together forever. It's where I got my start. And I honor that. 
I love that so much. Uh, our mutual friend, Sherry Salata, who's a dear friend of mine, when I, at some point, you know, she shared with me the story of how she actually got asked to be, you know, the sort of person in charge of everything. Yeah, and, executive producer. Of the yeah, show. And I said to her, how did that go down? And she said, Oprah called me in and said, I know who I'm going to ask to be the EP. And she said, oh, who is it? And she slid a piece of paper across the table and like had her name on it. And she's like, it's you. And she's like, it's me. Why would it be me? And she said, <laughs> she said, because you protect my heart. Wow. And, and that is very reminiscent of what you just said yeah. with so much weight to it. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. you said before, the reason you saw me like make that face of, it was like a face of recognizing a pattern, which is the way you spoke about protecting the people who do mill work mm -hmm. is the same thread. Because we're all the same. And I believe that with the, to the core of my being. Um, you know, Sherry Salata is one of my best friends. She married Jeremiah and me. She was, she is the best. I mean, and, you know, she, um, she, she was EP way after. I, I think I was already off the show. I had my own talk show at that point, which I hated. But she, um, and she was busy. She was like stuck on a bridge in Sydney and couldn't help me. And I was like, well, out here on my own, folks, in the formaldehyde-ridden CBS headquarters here in New York City. So coming right to you. Um, but, you know, there is a, there is, it is universal. I think we are all the same. And, and I think that, um, you know, my biggest wish is that at the end of this ride, I'll have raised two kids that um, move through the world in a similar way and, and care enough about, you um, how someone is experiencing their interaction with them as we've tried to teach them um, to, to do. I mean, that's the most important thing to say. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts around um, who in your life, was it a grandparent, was it your parents, like who in your life modeled that for you? that level of integrity? Ooh, wow. Definitely not my parents. I love them both madly. My father passed away six, seven years ago. Um, my mother is uh, still with us and they're both great. And they're both, I mean, they, they my father, my dad was one of my best friends, um, but he didn't have that chip. And my mom doesn't really have that chip either. I think it's something that, um, I think, listen, it's easy to, to, this might be a slightly controversial thing to say, but I, I find it honest. It's easy to start exploring that stuff when you're coming from a place of abundance and the bills are paid and you're not stressed out about making the rent and you're not stressed out about getting food on the table. Um, and I know that there's a lot of people out there in the world who don't have that luxury I was able to start that exploration in my twenties about what kind of person I wanted to be and who I was around. And that continues still to this day, but I, I had the luxury of coming from a place of abundance. I was on TV. I had a successful design firm. Um, you know, so I'm not sure. I, I don't think it was, it was handed down to me from, from my parents or my grandparents or anything like that. They're, by the way, they're not monsters. They were lovely, faulted people like everybody else in the world. Um, but it was it was it was a journey that I had to come on. I think I think maybe coming out um, as gay was probably the first inkling that I had that um, maybe I needed to take some time, go inward, and do some do some digging, um, do some evaluation of how I wanted to move through the world. Um, that's a very pivotal time for, for anyone. And it was most definitely a really pivotal time for me. I was 18, 19 years old. Um, and, um, you know, I think that probably brought me to my knees in a symbolic kind of way. Um, and does the, does a, does a real, you, you have to do a real deep dive, um, personality wise and, and character sort of character wise to come out of that. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And it's relatively young to have had the 
not only real self-awareness, but the courage to know what you know and let yeah. people know, and let people know what you know. That's really yeah. young. Yeah. Um, and being that you mentioned Sherry and she's our mutual friend, she's also a person who very much is a seeker. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mentioned to you before we started officially recording that I might ask you this, like what for you, uh, has been, whether it's a practice, a book, a meditation, a, a place, uh, is there, um, is there something in your life that you kind of go back to the well to ground your sense of centeredness? You know, the older I've gotten and as life continues for me, it's, it's, I don't meditate. I don't do yoga. I don't read a lot of sort of self-help books or listen to a lot of self-help kind of podcasts or anything. Um, I just really try to focus on the little, what I call like the moments in between mm -hmm. those moments, those small moments. Um, I guess the best example that I can give you is that every morning when we walk our kids to school, our son, Oscar, who's five reaches for my hand. And I always, you know, and I, it, it makes me like choke up too, but it's an interesting thing because there is a form of like sort of, meditation in terms of like focusing on exactly what's happening at that given moment. And every time I feel that little hand in mine, as we walk down the street, I am fully focused. Now you're crying, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's a thing and I recognize that it's finite and I recognize that that hand will grow and it won't reach for mine, you know, forever. So while it is, I'm there. I think that is so powerful. And I love that as the name of a book or a podcast or a whole way of life, just this, like the moments in between. And not only is it like, it's so obvious, like, as you say it, how important all of that is, but on this show and on any show, <laughs> yeah, probably, it shows. It's, always, it's, it's always about the big moments and yeah. the crescendos when yeah. really everything is not actually about that at all. No, it's, it's not all about the little moments in between. And I feel like one of the blessings for you that I'm just sort of extrapolating is when you, when you, I heard, I think it was Jim Carrey who said, I wish everybody could be rich and famous to find out that, you know, the, the money and the rich and the fame, it's nothing. Right. So um, I think one of the blessings that you were willing to receive, not everybody does, um, but there's something maybe like you said, that journey you took home to yourself at 18, yeah. 19, to know yourself. It gave you this like, you know, grounding of what's real and what's not real. And having had it early on, the fame, the lights, the name, the da, 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 all the right invitations to all the right parties um, kept you focused on what actually is where all the sustenance is, which is the moments in between. And uh, I've done 850 shows and we've interviewed all the all the, the people and amazing humans, but people don't really talk about that. There, there's something where they externalize their well-being to mm -hmm. the big moments. Yeah. And boy, is that a lose-lose. Yeah, it's a lose-lose. It's a real, that's a really, that's really well put. I mean, I just, you know, I look at my life professionally in one way. I don't believe you can compartmentalize. I don't believe in like, you can have a horrible primary relationship and be super successful at work. <laughs> no, and I, you know, like, I, you know like, I just like that to me is like such bullshit. Like everything we're, we are all connected as, as you I'm sure know, we are all, I believe we're all connected. I believe that within ourselves, every thing that we do whatever bucket we're putting it in, you know, profession, outward facing, inward facing, it's all the same. Like you're the same person when you walk onto Malcolm Gladwell's podcast last week or sit on the stage next to Oprah as you are when you're walking hand in hand with your five-year-old. 
And there's no distinction for me in terms of I'm not amped up differently. I'm not, I don't have to prepare anything. You know, it, there's, there's, there's just a different, like, I, there's just a, a continuity for me that I've always really tried to focus on. And that's not to say that, you know, I've had extreme failures. I've had, I've never had a successful TV show. Let's start with that. I mean, two seasons on a talk show with, you know, 280 employees a $50 million annual budget. And, you know, and that lasted two seasons and it was terrible. I was like trying to make a chicken five days a week. And I, I'm like Goldie Hawn and overboard. Like I, I hate, I prepared and handled raw food. Doesn't sound like me. So, I mean, like couldn't have been a worse job for me at the time. And, you know, my, 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 the shows I've done with Jeremiah and competition shows, ABC, CBS, NBC, like you name it. Um, but you know, who cares? Like, I, I really don't care. I, I don't, I think if Oprah also taught me years ago, if you, if you want to go out there and believe the good stuff that people say about you, you're so cute. You're so thin. You have such cool hair. Um, then you're also obliged to believe the bad stuff. So you have to make a decision about mm. whether or not you're going to believe any of it. And, and, and the, the real info has to come from inside. Wow. That's really cool. That's really, really cool. And that's a really important way to like frame all of that, all of that noise. Yeah. That's wow. Um, as far as all of the things that you've been a part of and you're continuing, what's the thing that's most exciting to you right now? Like what feels like there's a whispering of, I want to I don't know, be creative in this way or in this project in addition to enjoying obviously what matters most, your family. Yeah. I mean, you know, work wise, I'm I it's funny, I'm 52. I I spent 10 years not in my office. My main offices are in Chicago. Um, and then we moved to New York, back to New York, and Jeremiah moved his company basically to New York, but he still has offices in LA. And um then the kids were in school full time. And I was like, Hmm, I can't really like pad around the house answering emails on my phone. Like, what should I do? And so I opened an, an, an office in New York city for the very, really for the first time right before the pandemic. And now I have 12 people in this wow. office in New York and I come to work every day and I'm sitting behind my desk right now and looking out at the city and, everything is kind of convenient. It's near where we live, near where the children's go to, children go to school. And so um, it, I'm very re-energized in terms of being back in design and being in meetings with clients and, um, and creating. And, I'm, and, and that's extended to um, you know, my partnerships with the Shade Store, with Living Spaces, with PetSmart. We just launched Cats okay. and Dogs. And you know, it's, it's still really fun for me. I'm like, you know, I'm not out of ideas. I'm not, it doesn't feel like work. It feels like, it feels like, um, it still feels like I'm sort of playing like, Oh yeah, great. Today we're going to go take to a photo shoot with two Cocker Spaniels. Well, that's <laughs> going to be horrible. Um, so I'm still really in, I, in, I'm actually probably even more enmeshed in the creative process yeah. than I was. I and it feels that. good. It feels good to sit back down to something that I started 30 years ago in a, in a full-time kind of way, which has been a minute. Um, I'm working on a book, which I'm super excited about. Um, the concept was like, sort of like, I didn't want to do a, a, like one, a monotone, like a, a big book of all my work over the last 25 years. That was, you know, $85 and a coffee table book, it felt a little bit self-serving. And so the book that I sold was, um, like a, like Julia Child's cookbook, which everybody owns and will never replace. I wanted to try my best to take the last 25 years of everything I've ever learned and give that back. And so I'm working with a brilliant book designer and, and my team here in, in, at my company and we're, we're going around the country and we're photographing all these projects, not for vanity, but to illustrate what really works and what really like stands the test of time and what really, what, what things really, um, what things everyone can do at any stage. If you're, 
repainting your living room on a weekend and, and buying furniture online, or if you're going through a major gut renovation, or if you're building a house from scratch. And so we're breaking it down room by room, section by section. And it's not boring, which I was really afraid of because I didn't want to be interviewed for it. I was like, let's talk about tile. Please, somebody put a bullet between my eyes. Um, it's, 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 it's a dynamic, um, very thoughtful uh, sort of guide, but with really arresting visual examples at all different price points. But um, And I'm lucky that I have a 30-year career to be able to illustrate what matters to me and what I think will matter to other people um, when they're redecorating or renovating. I love that. I want to ask you, cause I'm in the beginning of designing, building our first like big house. We've never done that, but it was like, just bought a house that was done. And, uh, my designer said, okay, well just start making a Pinterest board and just, and we'll figure out what your aesthetic is. And I was like, this is legit so hard. And right. then you feel like this commitment level is like a hundred out of 10. Cause I right. have to look at that backsplash. And for someone like me and I, feel like a lot of the times my audience seems to have similar pain points that I do. Um, how the hell do you choose when they're all beautiful? It's like, she's like, okay, well just decide. Do you want the boho sheet? Do you want sort of shiplap? Do you want this? Do you want modern? I'm like, I, I have no idea. <laughs> what do you yeah. think is a good way of knowing <laughs> what won't bother you and get on your nerves? If you're making these choices and they're all beautiful how do you know which choice and which aesthetic to like choose and go down? It's the same way when you're shopping for clothing or like, you know, the only difference is, is that it doesn't feel bad to donate a dress or donate a pair of heels or whatever. And it feels really bad to rip out a backsplash or right. redo your shower tile. It feels terrible. I don't know anybody that that feels good too. Yeah. So, you know, for me, um, again, it, you, you, reference this but it's 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 about shutting out the noise it's about ignoring what the trends are and really di diving deep into um classic building materials you can use them in an inventive way but if something's been around since the 1920s chances are 20 years from now you're not going to hate your kitchen if you went with that and when something is like the newest, shiniest, I'll tell you a story. Actually, I was paid a lot of money years ago to go stand at the kitchen and bath show in Las Vegas. And, you know, I'm in the middle of this huge convention center representing a brand and, you know, sort of as an ambassador to their products and stuff and, you know, fine, great. There were hot dogs. I was happy. Um, but the, um, this, this man came up to me and he said, oh, you know, would you please, please, please come and look at our new product. It's amazing. I, I've followed you for years. I think you're going to love it. I'd love for you to help us get the word out. And I said, sure. And so I walked the, you know, 75 miles through the convention yeah. center, um, uphill both ways in the snow. And I, and I, um, I got to his little booth and it was a countertop that you could lean on and it changed color from the heat of your hand. And I looked at him and I said, I would never recommend this to anybody because it's the antithesis of what matters to me about home. And he was like, what do you mean? And look at how cool it is. It turns green, it turns purple, it turns like a mood ring as a countertop. And I just said, like, I'm not your guy. Like, I, I have to be honest with you. I, I, wish you real, I wish you well. And I'm sure there's going to be a market for this, you know, somewhere on Pluto, but in, in terms of the projects that, that I specify for, um, what I'm interested in is in, in classic. I'm interested in things that, you know, 25 years will still look great. You might want to repaint or recover something, but that hardware that you found online from an English hardware company uh, or on Etsy or that, that, that stone that isn't some new, crazy thing, but has been around since 1920. Like that's where I'm at. Um, I'm not a modernist. I never have been. I like modern furniture in old architecture, but I like things that like really look like they could have always been there and then have fun with wallpaper because you can hire the local wallpaper person to come back and steam it off in five years. If you're over it, 
you know, don't, don't do red cabinetry, do a red pillow, do a red coffee maker, like, you know, do the things like if you want to do things that express your personality, do them in things that, that are transient, that you don't have to hire somebody to change. And that's always been my rule of thumb. So in, to answer your question, don't get distracted as you're making all these decisions um, by what's new and the latest and the greatest and what the World Bureau says the color of the year is or the Pantone. It shouldn't matter. What matters is, is that there'll be room for you to bring that beautiful mirror home from a trip or that collection of pottery from a weekend with your friends going to flea markets. Um, that can go on your mantle, but make sure the mantle is something that you're going to love forever. I love that. And it's very grounding. And I love that the pops of color are things that are easily changed rather. Yes. I see a lot of blue kitchens and they're adorable and I, great. But like, it, <laughs> that's but, a big commitment to have a blue kitchen. It, it really is. And listen, if you really <laughs> know like, yourself, that's my way of saying do not do that. <laughs> well, it is. But like, if you know yourself really well, like my grandmother, my mother's mother, her house was blue and white period navy and white bright blue and white light blue and white for for 65 years she never departed from that color scheme she can have a blue kitchen right you know what i mean that's somebody who knows that that's where that's at she ended up not having a blue kitchen she had a blue upholstered chairs in the kitchen but still like you know you got to really know yourself this is not fashion fashion is different than home Fashion is transient and seasonal. Home shouldn't be. Okay. I want to make one other uh, comment, and I have a question about it because I, I find it really interesting. You you made this point where Oprah sort of advised, like, make things that the market can afford. The mass. Mm -hmm. Her market. audience, yeah. Her audience, yeah. 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 And um, I feel like I've been you know, living in Los Angeles for 20 years, I feel like I've been indoctrinated into like spending $350 on jeans or like things that are more expensive are just obviously better. And that's what you work towards. And, and yet there is so much beauty in the things that you've created. And we just bought these like outdoor patio chairs. Um, we just happened to buy them from living spaces. And someone was like, Oh my God, those are so gorgeous. Where did you get them? You know, who custom built them for you? Like I got them from living spaces. She's like, what? Like, they're amazing. I'm like, I know they're there. They were great. So what do you think about that? Like, what's your comment on, is it a racket? You know, that people think that spending more gets you more. Are there certain pieces where you would go that extra mile? Or do you feel like there is a lot to be said for things that are more affordable? Like, what do you think about that whole thing? Here's what I think. I think that as if you're going to create things that are affordable, it's your responsibility to know the finest quality so you know exactly why they're being priced the way that they are. Because anybody anywhere in the world can make anything now, right. and they can do it at any price. It's, a, it's Tom Friedman. It's the gold, global economy. It's Malcolm. It's, you know, we, we have access to everything. And, and hence the enthusiasm of the homeowner or renter creating their nest because they at their fingertips they can have hand-painted lampshades from india or they can have outdoor furniture from living spaces there's a reason why it's priced as what it is and that reason is is that you should still be able to live well with things that you can afford but the upper echelons of design and manufacturing knows no upper limits there's a very different there's a huge difference between a, a, a mirrored chest of drawers from 1940 Italy than a mirrored chest of drawers that you would see on the floor at a mass retailer. The, it's different quality mirror. It's hand done. It's the hardware, the way that it's put together. It doesn't mean that things that are affordable aren't great, but it's really like, up to the consumer to like that, that commercial with that sofa that fits together with Velcro that I'm obsessed with and you can turn it into like anything. And I'm like, why didn't I think of that? You know, I I've never ordered one, but like, I'm really <laughs> fascinated to know like, wow, it just like, it comes like in the size of like a vitamin. And then you just like, I don't know how it works. You add water and the whole thing like 
pops into a sectional. Um, wow, cool. I think that there's really good, there's really, there's differences in quality is the truth, but there's really good quality at affordable pricing. I mean, even my Nate Home line, I sold a half a million uh, towels a week at Target. And I took my Target towel and had sent that to my manufacturer for Nate Home. And I said, what technology has improved since these were made? But I want them to feel exactly the same way. And I want the Dobby and the design to be almost identical. Um, and I have a following of people who buy my towels and I use my own towels. And I want to make sure that the worst thing that I could possibly do would be launch on the market towels that were junk, that were right. less expensive. And just because they're for sale on Amazon. Yeah. And so, you know, I've been really careful about protecting, but like towels you know, is there, are they Turkish cotton? Are they hand sewed in France? N no, but they are Portuguese cotton and they're beautiful quality and they feel terrific and they're under $20. So what do you need? You know, like yeah. w w what's the priority? Yeah. If you're doing a whole project and so many of the women who listen to the show, like this is <clears throat> so much of where they feel creative and fun is working on their house. And I think during COVID, we saw a lot of people. Just oh my God, we all did. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a really fun conversation. Um, if you're going to splurge on one thing to sort of make the whole room feel grounded, right? Because I've been to people's homes where they want it to look a certain way, but they're using the most synthetic things and you feel yeah. it when you close the window or you look at it when the corner of the wall meets. And it's like that's that. Or when you're isn't... watching a real, an episode of real housewives, any city. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So if you're going to sort of like ground the room, would you say if there's one thing to splurge on its floors, is it lighting? Is it um, the marble for the, for the, 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 um, the counter, like what would be the thing that you feel like, which is it needs the, to be the most real thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The most real of the I mean, quality. listen, I use a lot of architectural salvage in all of my projects. So like I'll I'll find an old stone fireplace surround and have that installed in new new construction. Okay. Nothing looks more expensive to me and quality than bringing in aged building materials, reclaimed floors if you can afford it or a vintage fireplace mantle or beautiful vintage lighting. Um, you know, floors, by the way, are a really good example. Like back in the day, you had oak or walnut or, and it was solid and there were solid boards. And now pre-engineered flooring is amazing and it's yeah. great for all these different climates. So like, I'm not a snob about any of that. Okay. If it looks great, great. I love that. If, yeah. You just, like, saved us, you just saved us all so much money. No, but it's true. Like that's technology. You can't stand in the way, you know, of, of advancement. And that is an advancement. Um, if I'm doing a project in Aspen and it really calls for a, a beautiful old aged reclaimed, reclaimed floor and the client can afford it, then I'll specify that. Okay. But you know, for everybody else, a pre-engineered floor that's <clears throat> been distressed in the factory or you know, as part of the um, manufacturing process, I'm good. I, I'm I'm fine with that. Okay. And stone is stone. Doesn't matter okay. if it's from the stone yard in Ventura or if it's from the quarry. It's all from you know. It's all from God. I mean, yeah. in the end, right? Like yes. it's natural yes. material. Right. Okay. Last question about this. So, um, Deepak, I've gotten to know Deepak a little bit, and he said something to me that scared the daylights out of me, which is the most unhealthy thing in my life is my house, that my house is killing me. And I'm like, that is not a good thought. Perfect. Right. <laughs> Thank you, that's so convenient. <laughs> so he was like, you know, it's the paint, it's the air, your air quality in your house is so much worse than what's outside, even in LA, your desk, your clothes, like your house is slowly it's killing, killing you. That scared me. So, but at the same time, I try not to be like really pretentious about like everything has to, cause it's like at the end of the day, my grandmother grew up, like coming from Ukraine, living in a tenement with tuberculosis. She survived eating schmaltz. Like, I, I don't right. know how, and she lived to 96. Like, I don't know how much of this, but if you had to say similarly, if I had to pick one thing to be organic yeah. about in my house, like 
what's going to do the heavy lifting for me to save me from dying from sitting at home? <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> wow. Okay. Thanks Deepak. Um, now I'm super stressed out about it. I mean, listen, that I might not be the best guy to answer this question because okay. I like things. I like bleach. I like magic erasers. I'm like a Virgo. I like things spotless. I don't want it to smell like an organic lemon. I want it to smell like, <laughs> like, the, like a chem lab has just like, I want, I want, I want a spacesuit like for, for cleaning supplies and things like and detergents and stuff. I, it's, I'm not, it's, it's uh, unpopular. Um, I'm sure, but like, give me a chemical that works and I'm very old school about it. Um, you know, for me, honestly, it's really food related. It's like Michael Pollan, the omnivores dilemma. Like I wouldn't worry about your sideboard in your dining room as much as I would worry about what you're serving to your, your family. Like, you know, I do care about that. I do pay attention, but then I'll be in an out burger. I don't know. I'm the wrong guy for this. I really no, am. I, but actually that really calms me down because you know five or six or a thousand more things about it than I do. And like literally a week after he told me that, I had this gorgeous sideboard delivered and it smelled like... <laughs> like, like, like a different place. Yeah. And I was like... <laughs> <laughs> so I came back and they took it and my husband's like, but you really liked it. And I was like, I can't, I can't, it's killing me. Just looking at it. Yeah, no, I mean, listen, I he's probably, it. he's probably right. But again, you know, Too my bad. mom like smoked cigarettes and drank tab. I'm five, eight. That's probably like the worst thing that came out of that whole experience. But you know, I'm okay. <laughs> you're surviving. You're not just okay. You are, uh, you're the best. I enjoyed all of this. I'm so grateful that you are even more delicious of a human than I even thought you were. And I, I already had you like a 10 out of 10. So I'm going to text Sherry when I get off and just tell her how delightful you are. And she's going to say, I know, I know all about it. Um, tell people where they can go get cats and dogs things. Um, tell people where they can follow along and be a part of your journey. Yeah, of course. Um, I just want to say, I've also really enjoyed this. Thank you for your time and thank you for having me. But, um, the, the, here comes the shameless plug. Everything Please. is on Instagram at Nate Burkus. Um, also my website, nateburkus.com. Um, but, you know, I love those search engines. So PetSmart, <laughs> Shade Store, Living Spaces, Amazon for Nate Home. It's all over the place. I love it. I love that you allowed me to like have this deep dive with you because I really think everything goes back to people want to buy from people who they truly like. And you, that's your best super skill is you're very likable because you're present and honest and say nice, cool, inspiring things that you actually mean. So uh, this was just delightful. So thank you. Thanks. For it was a good energy it. exchange. It really was. Thank you, Nate. Have a great thank day. You. Thank you, you to your team. Okay. Bye.